Hey gang, I'm Nikki LaCroce, and you're listening to Who the Fuck? A show that explores the power of human connection and the profound resilience of the human spirit through compassionate conversations that help you better understand yourself so you can live with the sense of peace, purpose, and joy that you deserve. Each episode offers a safe space for guests to share intimate details of their personal journey and lessons learned along the way as we all seek to answer life's most important question. Who the fuck am I? Hey gang, thanks for joining the conversation. Today I'm sharing the mic with Christina Carlson. Christina is a self-relationship coach, speaker, facilitator, and the host of Bitches, Witches, and Queers. And Christina is certified through Beautiful You Australia Coaching Academy. Um, Did I say Australia Coaching Academy? That was weird. Um, (laughs) Christina is certified through Beautiful You Coaching Academy in Australia and the Devoted Energy Coaching School in South Carolina, and also has a bachelor's degree in theology and has devoted a lot of time to continued education around inter and intrapersonal relationships, which I think is really amazing. We've got to do the work for ourselves, and we the more we do that, we can help others. So welcome to the show, Christine. I'm super excited to have you here. Super excited to be here. You have such an interesting story, and we've only just tapped into such a very small portion of it when we first spoke. So I'm excited to dive into things. I feel like a good place to start would be you were raised in what you refer to as a deeply evangelical Christian setting in the Midwest. And this is something as someone who was raised Catholic, I have some semblance of what it means to have a religious upbringing, but we were sort of Easter Christmas people. (laughs) And I had to go through the sacraments and, you know, do CCD, which was like Sunday school, but it was pretty limited to that. And I also played basketball for the organization there. And I never really felt connected to religion. So as soon as I didn't have to partake in it and I was able to make that choice for myself, I really just sort of distanced myself from it. And I think it frustrated my parents a little bit, but had that, well, what are we going to do about it? That's a very different scenario (laughs) than I imagine what your upbringing was like and what you went through to be able to come to where you are today to feel so connected to yourself. So would you mind sharing a little bit about how you've, how you kind of came to be where you are um, by way of leaving that life behind. Yeah, what a what a beautiful way to to share your story and then introduce that question. Just as a podcast host, I'm deeply admiring you already. <laughs> I love it. You're so complimentary. Thank you. <laughs> I uh, yeah, deeply evangelical. I say that because um, I was not only evangelical, but I was raised in the Midwest. Um, which is considered the Bible Belt. And I was homeschooled until high school and then went to a private Christian school. And then I went to um, a Bible college and got my degree in theology and then went on to work at Bible colleges um, for the next few years. So deeply evangelical, meaning to say that like the first, some of the earliest books and stories that I read were about missionaries, (laughs) white colonizers, (laughs) <laughs> who were um, going abroad and dying for the cause. That was the deepest, deepest way of showing your commitment to the faith was to die. Devotion. And devotion. Yes. Um, that was, and I know like most people know about the stories and the saints and like, you know, you know that from being Catholic, but like, this was like bedtime stories and our deepest heroes. And growing up that way, I had a deep fear of being on the wrong side of things because of hell. And we were taught that that was something that could happen in your mind. You could sin within your mind. And um, consequently, you could sit on an accident. And um, so I developed a form of OCD, like compulsive thoughts of of going to hell. And um, I didn't know that that's what it was. I just thought that I was, you know, being attacked by a demon or something. <laughs> I mean, it's like, that's just such a fascinating thing to hear because, you know, I'd say now more than ever with just the visibility we have through multiple social media platforms, documentaries, things like that, there's a lot more coming to light about the cult-like nature or cultness of organized religions and especially the evangelical side of things. 
And to hear you say that you were taught that you could sin within your mind. I mean, if that's not the foundation for deeply rooted anxiety, I honestly don't know what it is because I had concerns about things that I would think when I was younger being like, is it okay that I thought that? But you can't, you know, thoughts arise. You you have to allow that to happen. And so to think about how constrained that would make your entire life because they're not only trying to control and manage what you do, they're trying to control and manage what you think at the origin of thought. Yeah. Yeah. So, so if I was going to stay safe, which, you know, obviously this wasn't intentional. This is my beautiful child brain keeping me alive. I knew that I needed to be convinced internally. So there were things that, that I could not consider without risking my own safety. So in that way, like within that system, you build a framework that cannot consider external view because thinking alone is a risk. So there was no internal safety. It's the opposite of internal safety because I was also taught that my conscience and my whatever voice was speaking to me internally was God. But that turned out to be an inner critic that came from my parents and all the worst things I was taught about the Bible. So it was a constant voice of shame that I was then told that's the voice of God. And I developed OCD. (laughs) Well, I mean, it's like, do you, I feel like you and I clicked so quickly and this is so easy to conversate with you that I would have this conversation many times over going down different paths. but. Do you feel like when you are able to reflect on it now because you've been able to construct your life in a way that has afforded you the freedom that you deserve and need, that it's hard to believe that that was ever something that you thought? Because I feel like you it must feel so disconnected from your reality now. Yeah, I mean, it's very... It's very different. And to be honest, sometimes it still brings me to tears to to think about my little kid self having that much fear that my parents didn't alleviate. Like, like, you know, I, I have a daughter now, like she gets scared that there's stuff in the bedroom. And, you know, we talk about perceived threat and real threat and the differences and like, yeah. Your parents are are there to to show you what to actually be afraid of and what's not dangerous, what is. And it was like, I was like, I'm afraid of the boogeyman. And they're like, yeah, he can whisper in your mind. And I'm like, Fuck. if that's not the promo clip. <laughs> I think that's such an important thing to point out because we as children have that initial attachment to our parents and that inherent need to be protected by them, whether or not they're equipped to do that protecting. And if you're in a scenario where their beliefs are so diluted and threatening to their own safety, then of course they're going to have that effect on you. And one of the biggest problems with that, I would imagine or or honestly I can see as an outsider looking in and even even just being raised Catholic honestly because I feel like when you're brought into a religion at a young age you're not given the choice and my wife and I talk about this a lot it's not really fair to assign a religion to somebody when they don't even have a foundational understanding of that thing that they're being brought into Right. So even if the intention is good, it it takes away this really important autonomy in that decision making process. And you're sort of just thrust into it and expected to adhere to it. So when you think about how you were raised, do you feel like there was any point in time where that wasn't a focal point? Or was it just like repetitive, you know, reinforcement that this is what it is and this is how you have to behave to maintain, you know, this theoretical safety really, because what it was doing was making you feel extremely unsafe. Yeah. 
there wasn't really a break in that. No, my parents were really committed. And um, my dad himself was raised Catholic and found evangelicalism in high school. And then his family joined an evangelical church. They met in Bible college. And my mom was raised in a brethren church. Um, so the commitment to that was was fierce. Um, and it was a part of of everything we did. They were incredibly dedicated. And their commitment in by way of really taking things seriously is in some ways admirable. They really believed what they said. Like mm-hmm. they really, really did it. Um and honestly, like looking at it, it's like, of course, like they they believed it so fiercely that they didn't want me to burn in hell. Like that was a re- reality for them. Yeah. You and know, because of that, it's like, I don't want my kids to burn in hell. This is what I have to do to keep them safe. Oh my gosh, totally. And when you frame it that way, I I understand that that's what the perception is for a lot of people who are really down the rabbit hole. And at the same time, you reached a point in your life where you started to question this. So what do you think? Well, I guess I want to ask two questions. I imagine there was a moment or at least a series of moments that you recall that sort of led you down this path of getting to where you are today. And then the secondary question to that would be, did your parents ever express any sense of wondering more about what other options they had, you know, and because I'm curious how you got to a place where you had the curiosity and you felt like you could act on it, whereas they were very entrenched in this way of living. Excellent question. Um, no, my parents, the, the second question, no, my parents did not explore other options. That was not an option. However, there was this weird little nuance of a thing that happened, which is that when we were younger, my parents visited different kinds of churches and we attended different kinds of churches for a different number of years. So I remember attending a Messianic Jewish church for five or so years when I was really little. Um, and then we did a vineyard church for about a year, which if you don't know, that's like the wild dancing. My parents, my parents were not that liberated. So they're like, fuck no. Um, and then we landed in a like non-denominational church for the majority of high school, mm-hmm. but we continued doing a Bible memory program called Awana, which is based in a Baptist church. And we partnered with community churches like our church did. So when we asked about that, there was an answer and it was that everyone has an interpretation, but you, you have to have the core things. And so there was this concept of like, Sure, the vineyard has this interpretation of spiritual gifts, and Baptists have this like interpretation of how like we're supposed to have order. Presbyterians have like their structure and their liturgy and whatnot. Um, but at the core of it all, they believe the core tenets of the faith, which mm-hmm. is God literally died, Jesus was or Jesus was God, like the Trinity. There was like a set of those things that they were like, if it has this then the rest of it is like up for interpretation, which is the concept that allowed me to consider that all religions might have something to teach me. What it took many years for me to get to that place because that's not what they meant by it. It's sort of like if you were doing a multiple choice test and you're like, I feel like either one of these could be the answer. And they're like, so you've left me with room to decide which one it's going to be. And they didn't anticipate you running with that. No, (laughs) no. They're like, this has gone horribly wrong. (laughs) But I mean, it wasn't until like, you know, 10, 15 years later that I was like, oh, you know, maybe there's good in everyone. But like, for me, the beginning of my journey out happened when I happened long before I actually left. Like you said, was there a series of steps? The first was really connecting, reconnecting to my body and like having physical sensation again through mm-hmm. a hula class that I took in Hawaii. And I was like, you know, through the church, given permission to move my hips, which had never fucking happened before. And I was just like, actually feeling my body move. And that was not something that was like really permitted that I really had frozen 
my body for so many reasons that in this practice, it was like, I came alive again. Wow. And so I started like, my body was like, now you know how to feel good. So you're going to feel really miserable. (laughs) And I was like, okay. So I was very, very uncomfortable and distressed about the relationship I was in because it was really fucked up. And I didn't know why, because I hadn't experienced that before. Like I just thought misery was a part of this. But then I, when I started to feel it in my body, I had less and less tolerance for being in it because it was so uncomfortable. And so not just uncomfortable, but painful. And that's kind of what led me out of that relationship. And I started over and moved to Kansas City with my brother and sister-in-law, who also studied theology at a Bible college that turned out to be a cult and kicked people out just like mine did. And so we had some things to talk about, and we had like some concepts that we picked apart, and um, because we're all smart people. And well, you're also introspective people, is what I'm hearing from that as well. Yeah, my parents were introspective as well, so we learned we learned that from them. Um, I really appreciate that you can acknowledge those parts of your relationship with your parents because, you know, I read this book um, a while ago, Adult Children of Emotionally Immature Parents. Have you ever heard of it? I've heard of it. I haven't read it yet. So um, when I say I've read it, I've I've read through it and picked out pieces that I felt were, were really good for me in a moment. And part of it was being able to give your parents grace for not knowing what they didn't know or not being able to address your needs in certain ways that you needed them to. Mm -hmm. Because we often look at our parents and think, come on, you could have done better. You should have done better. And I, I think in many ways that can absolutely be true. And I also think at the same time, it can be true that they didn't have access to those parts of themselves that would have allowed them to do that. Exactly. We're all always doing the best we can. Yeah. And I like, especially as a parent myself, I have a lot of grace for having trouble parenting and having a difficult time having capacity for things. And they, they literally did the best they could. They did not hit us ever. Like I, you know, got spanked once. And then my dad was like, we're never doing that again. That's ridiculous. You know, like there was so much grace that was offered me I was genuinely loved in spite of whatever trauma I picked up from that experience in those communities I can acknowledge the beauty of their intentions and the like the the love that they meant to give me I really love the way you said that Christina and I feel like it's beautiful to hear that because it says also a lot about you as a person and I think the fact that your you said your sister and your brother as well had you all sort of had this convergence of experiences, and to even be able to do that shows something that is very tight knit about your family, and to be able to come back around to that as adults and sit with that discomfort of what you knew, but also acknowledge the possibilities of what could come and even looking at what you've done to get where you are, to pull yourselves out of these circumstances that didn't fit you Mm -hmm. is really commendable. I feel like people who are indoctrinated in various religions or whatever else it might be, honestly, I mean, for the purposes of this conversation, religion, but people want to feel like they belong. They want to feel connected to something and they want to as you said, feel loved. And I think a lot of people who are raised in these really evangelical settings or in cults, it's like that aspect of love does not translate at any point in their life. So it's really amazing to hear that you have that respect for your parents and understand and see that. Mm -hmm. And to be able to know that that in and of itself has the element of being a gift amidst what I imagine was a lot of emotional turmoil. Mm, Yeah. I, I feel like in many ways, my brother and sister raised me. My brother's younger than me. My sister's older than me, but I always felt like the youngest in, in a lot of ways, but in, in the way of being lost in the middle, I was definitely the middle kid. And I've, I've been rereading journals because I'm working on like a little book that I'm writing. Oh, I love that. Um, 
about stories of like, you know, my life. I might, I might publish it or I might just write it for me. But from my earliest memories, I felt safe with my sister and completely seen by my brother. That's really incredible to be able to reflect on that and acknowledge that and see that as an adult. Do you feel like you came to that realization as you were going through this exercise of writing out what you were thinking and feeling? No, I, I've, I've thought about it many times over the course of my life, and I tell them every time I think about it. <laughs> oh, I think this is one of the things that really made me feel very close to you very quickly is I feel like neither of us has the ability or maybe desire even um, to kind of dance around things. You know, if I feel something, I want to express it. And it it shows up in the way that you communicate because mm-hmm. I think a lot of why people get stuck in these ruts of, you know, shame and self-loathing, regardless of what your circumstances, is that you don't, you get so much of the negative reinforcement, you don't get the positive reinforcement. And it's nice to hear nice things, you know? Mm-hmm. And when we feel those things, I've gotten to a place where I just say it, you know, like I really want to, I mean, Nicole will joke with me that my greatest strength is giving people genuine compliments and just having the desire to, to say it when I feel it, because I know the amount of times that I have thought something and I haven't said it. And I thought, man, I may, maybe it would have changed somebody's day a little bit. And just knowing that that brings you some sort of positive energy and some sort of light, like it really translates into such a powerful dynamic between people when everybody involved is giving that. But just to be able to acknowledge it to people who might not be prone to that, I think invites them to do that more themselves. Absolutely. And yes, I see that in you as well. I I love that because like I just get I just get so tired like pre- dancing around things and pretending like I don't see things and like I don't have the fucking energy or time to be like to not you know say it if it's there like you know I want to express it if I have the energy to I have to like I have to be conscientious of like my people pleasing tendencies so like I will pause <laughs> um and then I'm like oh this is this is real I- and then I'll say it. But like, it's, it's especially true with the people that mean the most to me. It's so critical to share those things. I'm reading journal entries on TikTok. Anyone who's here, like go check out my TikTok. I'm reading oh, my yay. journal entries from 2016 and 2017 oh, through my deconstruction process. <laughs> One of them was in a morning in Kauai and my boyfriend at the time came over and hugged me and my heart thrilled. And I was just like delighted. And only later did I realize how fucking ridiculous that was because it was so rare. I was starved for affection and compliments. So anything that was given to me was like this scrap that I held on to. You know, it's interesting that you say that because when I was in the last, as I refer to it now, a situation, I was very starved for attention and affection. And I didn't realize it as much because I was doing the podcast. So I was getting the connection in a lot of ways that I needed. I was made to feel like I wasn't physically affectionate or I didn't want to be emotionally available. And it's like, no, when you don't trust somebody and you don't feel safe, you're not going to feel like you want to physically engage with them or emotionally engage with them because you're hyper vigilant, you know? Mm-hmm. But when you have that feeling of safety and you can open yourself up to that, that really changes your perspective on things. And so to your point, even just getting a little bit of that is like, oh my gosh, the dopamine, you know, and it's like, this is exactly what I need, the serotonin, all of it, just like endorphins, everything that I need. It feels so healing to have those moments, but you don't want it to go away. You don't want it to be fleeting. And what you're describing, right, is the feeling of lack that that you wanted more of that sort of like when you described uh, doing hula dancing, that you knew what it felt like. So now you wanted to feel it more. Is that a good comparison? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Spot on. Nailed it. (laughs) Um, So was there a moment coming out of that feeling where you decided that that was something you wanted to pursue and have more of in your life? (laughs) Oh, God, I wish it was that like clean cut. Um, (laughs) 
I, Fair enough. <laughs> after that, I was in that relationship for another year. And um, I got to the point where I would rather die or be alone forever than marry this person. And that's when I allowed myself to leave. I said, if I die alone, I, I'm okay with it. Well, you know, that raises an interesting question. Do you feel like during your youth and as you were, I guess, let's say uncovering the parts of yourself that really weren't allowed to be exposed previously, that were you recognizing that you needed to find a way to accept yourself and love yourself throughout that journey? Or was that concept even just still foreign to you because you hadn't really been taught to connect with those parts of yourself? Oh, yeah, that was not a thing. Like self-acceptance was like, you know, the worst slippery slope. Like judge yourself, take every thought captive. Your body is evil and tempting you. There was no self-acceptance or self-love. That was self-love is like one of the greatest sins. So I didn't have a concept for anything good existing within me. Everything good in me came from outside, from God. So I like, I, so I had a real fear of becoming a lesbian. We'll start there. Um, (laughs) Because, you know, I heard things and um, the way that people talked about gay people was worse than death. It's our agenda, Christina. Yeah. (laughs) To stay alive. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So I would like have these panic attacks, you know, similar to like, being afraid I was, you know, not saved. And um, I would be like, um, this is real TMI. I was, I would be like masturbating and thinking about my, myself and my own body. Um, and, you know, I had a woman's body, whatever the fuck that means. So I was like, oh my God, am I gay? Right. Yes. And I would like, <laughs> I would spend like the next 30 minutes, like talking myself off a cliff because I actually felt attraction for men. And so I couldn't be gay because I had had attraction for men. So I really like, I really erased myself in that to calm myself the fuck down. Well, I I didn't know what bisexuality was. It was not a thing. I was going to say when we were growing up, I feel like there was very much a distinction of you're gay or you're straight. There wasn't really the more broader acceptance of bisexuality, to be honest with you. I mean, there were shows that would joke about, you know, bisexuals are greedy. And I feel like as a lesbian, I was kind of like, yeah, man, you know, I mean, but I had boyfriends. I slept with guys. Like it wasn't that I, like I went through what was clearly a bisexual phase in retrospect. Um, Part of that was also of convenience because I was like, where are all the lesbians? You know, Um, that didn't work out great. But I, I also think that it's interesting that you had the self-awareness in those moments to feel like you had to talk yourself off that ledge. It makes me wonder when, so obviously you were taught to essentially prohibit yourself from really exploring any sense of who you are, particularly in your body. And how was the concept of homosexuality addressed in your early life that made you feel that sense of it sounds like a little bit of guilt in those moments to try to pull yourself off that track. Yeah. So in each neighborhood that we lived in growing up, there was two different neighborhoods. The first neighborhood, there was a gay couple that lived up the street and they were also fat. And my mom is fat phobic and homophobic. And so every comment about that family was they're disgusting and dirty and gross. And they're like, terrible parents it was all the usual tropes of like you don't want your life to end up like that but it wasn't even directed at us it was just general judgment of like that's the worst kind of evil and then every once in a while you'd hear it from the pulpit the worst kind of um i don't even know the word i don't even want to repeat it just like disparaging comments about like it's terrible as a concept and so it wasn't like i was told that I could fall into it because as a someone socialized as a woman, I did not have a sexuality. So it was men's sexuality that we were taught about. Mm -hmm. Um, So it wasn't really a concept 
but I knew from seeing my neighbors that that some people did live the lifestyle. Yeah. <laughs> quote unquote. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nice call out. <laughs> <laughs> but I um I knew what I knew that there were gay people in the world and I was told they were uh, you know, God did not condone, like condemn, uh, condemned was probably the best way to, that they said that condemned that quote unquote behavior. Yeah. Um, you know, so it was terrifying. Yeah. That has to halt your personal evolution so much. I mean, even just I, when I was t- 12 or 13, so I was in seventh grade, I lost the group of friends that I had met when I went into middle school because they all thought I was a lesbian. I mean, okay, but <laughs> I rude. I didn't even look like this then, Um, (laughs) but, you know, it hurt a lot because it was very isolating and it was this mindset really being condemning. And so you think about that and that was what, like 25 years ago now for me and how kids coming out at younger ages now feeling comfortable. Like my friend's 12 year old daughter just came out to her and I was like, I could have done it if I had known that that was safe to do, I would have done it. But it felt like I would be isolating myself to acknowledge that part of myself. And it was safer for me to exist within everybody else's expectations and not allow myself to acknowledge these parts that were very obvious, clearly, like clearly people were calling me out on it, but that stopped me from coming out sooner because I Mm. felt similar to what you're describing, that feeling of nobody's saying it directly to you. Like you personally, like you shouldn't be doing this, but it's the disdain with which it's spoken about that makes you, it it internalizes a shit ton of shame. Yeah. People don't realize like the power of, of that. They're like, nobody gay is around. And I'm just like, you don't fucking know that. No, (laughs) no. Oh my God. Um, so when, at what point did you get to a place where you were able to extract yourself from the religious aspects of your upbringing? The fact that you went to school for theology, you went to Bible college, you said like the amount of information that you must have in your brain that honestly probably isn't relevant you learned so much stuff that probably doesn't matter. I'm sure that there are bits and pieces that are probably (laughs) helpful in your everyday life as like a foundational, you are a human and you think about things, but it feels like a lot of education on something that probably didn't provide a ton of value to parts of your life that you wanted to grow. Um, I might regret this as some conservative might come the fuck after me later for saying this. I don't think they're listening to this show. (laughs) I hope not. Get off the wrong algorithm if you are. (laughs) Um, or change your mind. And change your mind. Just try. Just try Just it keep out. Listening. Pretend. <laughs> keep keep listening. Fake it till you make it. <laughs> I um really just wanted to go to California and wear whatever I wanted. So this Bible college had a looser dress code than I was ever used to. You could wear tank tops. They didn't monitor short length. I'm six feet tall, so that was a big deal to me. I just like had zero faith in myself. And I believed that the only thing I could do was go to Bible college and get married and become a missionary or a pastor's wife. I didn't realize then that I would like, you know, would hate that much human interaction or social norms more like I like people. But I I really fucked around for the first year and a half of Bible college, which it was two years long. So it was like um, what I learned was people. I was telling someone this the other day. I I had a realization in college that my own at Bible college that my own decisions I had to live with. I was messing around with this guy who was my best friend's ex and she didn't know. I lied to her face about it, which Oh, was I've been a, in that situation. A fun social experience in itself. Um, but he called me and was like I have tickets to this concert. Can you go? And I couldn't. And he's like, I'm going to invite, you know, so-and-so, this other girl. 
are you okay with that? And in this moment, I was just like, if I say yes, I need to be okay with this. And so I was like, yeah, I'm okay with it. And honestly, I was, but it was this huge realization for me that in a social setting, like only I am responsible for my emotions. And I I would have to have said something different if I wanted something different to happen. And it was like this huge self-responsibility awareness that like in the middle of Bible college, my own self-reflection is like, you got to be self-responsible. And I was like, okay. I didn't honor my body necessarily going forward at that point, but I was like, oh, I have to be okay with what I say I'm okay with. I can't say anything else about it afterwards. Like I have to really be like, okay, this is mine. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I really respect that perspective and that insightfulness around your decision-making because so many people are so passive aggressive about shit like that. It's like, yeah, no, it's fine. And then somebody gets reamed as soon as, you know, that event's over. And to me, that's both about boundary setting and expectation setting. And with your coaching practice, I feel like that's one of the things that we talked about. And also that I read when I was um, looking at your site is helping people understand the importance of setting boundaries and knowing yourself well enough to understand what those boundaries are. Yeah, that's a whole thing. I I feel like... (laughs) I feel like that was the start of my awareness of that concept. I wouldn't have called it boundaries or I wouldn't have had any name for it. It was just like this, the baby sprigs of awareness that were sort of starting to pop through for me. And I I told this concept to a lot of Christians and it kind of blew their minds at the time because it's not a Christian concept, but I was so dedicated. They were like, cool. Um, Was that like, you're the only person that has to live with what you do we're so focused on other people, especially within that circle, but it's like, you fucking have to live with it. They don't. So choose for you. And like, here I am, I could debate you in theology. I was on the Veritas forum, my degree in theology. And I'm like, only you have to live with what you decide. But I I love that. I love (laughs) that because we need people with your knowledge and also your self-awareness to be able to bridge the gap for people who don't have the knowledge and are just like blindly devoted and not considering how life operates outside of that ecosystem. And one of the things that Nicole and I talk about constantly is that feeling of like, how do you get people who are so dedicated to something to understand that it doesn't serve them to hate other people, especially If the thing that you are so against has zero bearing on your life, it has no bearing on your life whatsoever. None, zero, zip. It's those are other people's lives, other people's choices. Why do you have any opinion on it? Now, I could say (laughs) the term devil's advocate feels, I don't know, um, a little (laughs) on the nose. nose. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Yeah, Um, right there. And it's like, Okay, so on the flip side of it, I'd be like, well, why would anybody be evangelical? Why would you choose that? You know? And so I'll step away from it for a second and think to myself, okay, well, you're seeking something. That's why you connect to that. That's why you want a sense of community. You want a sense of belonging. You want a sense of faith. Like these are all reasonable things. You can have those things, but you having those things should not stop other people from having the things that they want that are not the same as that. And so as much as I can sit there and try to flip the narrative and say, okay, well, maybe I'm doing the same thing. I'm not hating somebody for doing that. I don't understand it and I would never choose it, but I'm not sitting here or not going to churches and yelling at people about how they don't deserve to live because this is what they do. That would be absurd. And frankly, if we're being honest, a real big waste of time, like do something else with your time. And energy contribute that in a better way, actually facilitate good in the world. And I feel like you coming out of this situation is such a great example of how that type of growth, following an upbringing that is deeply evangelical, is so impactful for not only people who have similarly come out of that life like you have, but also for people like myself and people who've never had any religious affiliation to hear that and understand that because it, without these conversations, there's no way 
to connect the dots of what you said at the beginning of the conversation between all of our shared humanity. And that's really what it's about. That's the label. The label is human. We are human. Yeah. Yeah. Have you, um, have you heard of Don Miguel Ruiz? No, I have not. Um, he wrote a couple of different books that are pretty popular. Um, he's of the Toltec tradition, which don't ask, I don't know how to explain it, but he wrote this <laughs> book um, called the five levels of attachment. It explains this concept with religion very well. So I'll, I'll explain it in a sports analogy like he does in the book, which is the first level is like sports are cool. The second level is like, you know, sports are cool. And I like people who watch sports. You kind of feel for the game. You start to feel a little bit more invested. Mm -hmm. The third is like your, your, your team is like, is really is better maybe than the other teams and you know they deserve to win more the fourth level is like i don't really talk to other people who like other teams like obviously my team is better and i'm really dedicated to this and like you know eagles fans oh i don't even know what sport eagles no, is but oh my god no it's so weird that you said that because growing up outside of philadelphia eagles fans are who i was thinking of Really? Football. Is that Philadelphia? Yeah, yeah. It's oh my football. god, that's Thank hilarious. <laughs> um, level five is you actually wish harm on people who are on the other team. It comes from, like you said, this desire to be a part of a team. It comes from very natural human instincts to belong. But there's so many factors at play, right? Like we're smart beings in general. We only do things with a reason. If we have not allowed ourselves to accept difference within ourselves, neurodiversity, difference in ethnicity, difference in sexuality, we reject those things within ourselves and we internalize them. And that can create a really intense objection to someone thriving outside of the framework that we believe we have to stay in. So. If we are in this and we've given up things, we've built a brick wall around ourselves every time we make a choice to stay when it feels against our body to do so. It's like you make a decision to sign with a company that does oil drilling and you're just like, you know, oil drilling is killing the planet. Every time you invest more in that company and it, it grates against your body. Sometimes, this isn't always the case, but most of the time you are basically investing in something that is against yourself. You're digging so your you, heels in deeper. Yes, you start to get more and more defensive about your choice. Because you don't want to be criticized. Because you don't agree with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh my God, so good. That's so spot on. And I love the way that you just described all that. I think the sports analogy is perfect because it's so simple and so straightforward. And we all know that feeling, right? Or you can at least witness other people exemplifying those things. Yeah. Take veganism. You could do literally the same thing and take it to level five. Yeah, totally. Because it really makes the case for how much projection is happening for people too. You're all complacent and complicit at this point. And unless you actually, to your point, whether it's leaving a religion or trying to not be corrupt amidst a very corrupt system, you have to stick to who you are and your moral foundations and your integrity. And I've really established over the past few years something that I didn't consider a lot when I was younger, how important integrity is. And it's not that I didn't understand the importance of it or that I didn't want to lead by example when it comes to integrity. But I also feel like it's very easy to lower your standards when the people around you have lower standards. And my ex didn't have integrity. And I feel like there were moments where my integrity waned because of that. And that's my own decision. That was my own choice. And I look back on it now and I'm with somebody who holds certain things in much higher regard. And I would much rather emulate that and know that I'm being more true to myself than feel like I've just acknowledged that I'm doing something that makes me feel shitty. And that's just the way it is. And so many people are like, well, what are you going to do about it? Change it. <laughs> yeah. So, so like, 
I, I love that. I love the way you named that. Yeah, there there is so much responsibility that needs to be taken, but we are averse to seeing ourselves. Our egos really fight very hard against us seeing the reality of who we are because if we see all of it all at once, we could fucking combust. It's very hard for us to come to grips with that and much more so when you have intentionally or complacently or complicitly caused harm. It's like looking at your own internal racism. You're just like looking at your own bias. You have to be able to do this in a way that you can be with the harm you've caused and not shame spiral. If you're shame spiraling, you're putting it back on the other person and you're not going to do anything about it. Oh God, you're so right. It was one of the hardest things I had to do to acknowledge the role I played in the abusive relationship that I was in. Yes. And I hated yeah. fucking being told that I needed to take responsibility for some of it because I'm like, fuck that. This person did all this shit and this is how I responded because of that. Mm -hmm. And it's like, yes, but you in many cases had choices and you chose differently than maybe you would have liked to have or because of the abuse, maybe you chose differently, but it still doesn't change the fact that I contributed to it and I stayed. And that's not to, you know, that's not to victim blame or shame myself or it's anyone not else. A blame. It's just an acknowledgement and you have to acknowledge it. And I agree with you completely. Our instinct is to project the blame. We don't want to be at fault. We don't want to have to be accountable for something that we don't like. It feels, That's, it feels really rough. Yeah. And I, I love how you pointed out just that the difficulty of looking inward in those moments too, you know, to be able to establish that you're not satisfied with who you are. I'm curious when you were. At that point in Bible college before you left and you were talking to all of these people and sort of saying you have the freedom of choice. That's the beauty of free will as a human being. Um, do you feel like that was really the major catalyst for all of the growth that then ensued? Or do you feel like it was still kind of a gradual progression? Because that's a lot of unraveling trauma for years. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. was it was like a very, very wild spiral. See, I really believe that people are always telling us a lot more than they know they're telling us. And I was doing that for a very long time. I was giving advice from a very different lens than I was professing to be giving that advice from. My mind, so through Bible college and through my upbringing, my mind is very adept at um, jumping through loopholes and jumping through hoops to get to a certain point. So I'm great at debate and like finding a way to do things. Like if I could focus, I would have been a great lawyer. It's a very like, it's a wild skill. Like you have to do it constantly to stay in a space that just like, isn't, you know, reflected around you. And so it took me a, a long time. Like I remember <laughs> right before I broke up with my ex, I had a conversation with someone who said that they weren't really attracted to the guy that they were considering dating. And I was like, actually, my advice is that if you wouldn't date them, if you weren't a Christian, you shouldn't be with them. <laughs> and she's like, that's great advice. <laughs> and looking back, I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, I was already in my head somewhere in my body, just like, but if, but if, but if, like, I totally, there's you an exit ramp. <laughs> I like it, that. Do you feel like it took you getting to where you are now, or at least further along that path to be able to reflect on that and recognize that mentality that yeah. it was sort of this subconscious oh, yeah. surfacing and it was just all of a sudden infiltrating moments of your life that were then, now you can look back on them and see, I mean, I guess, I guess that tracks. <laughs> Yeah. And I am still very human in this. I, you know, hire a lot of support for myself so that I have a better vision of myself because it's just nice to have yourself reflected in a way that you can see, see what's going on. Um, it's very helpful for me and I make it a point to have a lot of that in my life, but I didn't have a lot of that in my life that would have been reflected to me in a way that would have been supportive. So I didn't see what I was doing or how I was, you know, presenting. I didn't really have a very clear view of myself. It took a lot till a lot later. It was like um, 2014 and 13 when I started to question the inerrancy of the Bible because it was written by a bunch of white men and Rob Bell started to take apart the concept of hell. And I actually deconstructed the literalness of the Bible before I tackled the concept of hell. But it was like, to me, I started to see in Rob Bell's writing this humanity 
first perspective. And that resonated with me so strongly in a way that nothing else had ever resonated with me. I've always been fascinated with people. I've always cared about people. I've always felt God and divine and whatever that is, life force in people. And so to me, to hear Rob Bell's perspective on the different random translations of the Bible, it felt so non-judgmental and so like unangry that it was just like, oh yeah, I can totally take that. I listen to Rob Bell's stuff now. He's just a fascinating person, but he's he's a disruptor. And I really related to that, that just like wild kind of, I don't fit the box. Yeah. Well, you're making deal. me want to look into Rob Bell's work. And it's fascinating to think about how it really sometimes just takes one message. You know, yeah. somebody who can explain something with a level of clarity or um, intention that maybe we hadn't heard before. Even just what you described with the five attachments, right? To simplify it, to make it consumable for anybody. And then you make it easier for people to not only hear what you're saying, but to observe what you're saying Mm -hmm. and digest what you're saying and process it. And I do feel like one of the things that frustrates me about people who fall into deeply religious or cult followings And or I guess, I don't know, sometimes I just feel like all religions are cults. And I know that might alienate people, but that's how I feel. And I think that there's a difference between faith and religion. And I certainly believe that people should have faith. That said, I think that, you know, giving people the opportunity to think for themselves, to be intentional about why they believe what they believe, to ask themselves why they believe what they believe is so, so important. When you said humanity first, that's literally, I say this, (laughs) I say that because I don't understand why that's not the way that it is. It feels obvious to me that we should be focusing on humanity first. And if you restrict people from being able to explore what that means, then of course you're going to end up with these archaic mentalities, these restrictive behaviors. And at the end of the day, it honestly just feels really desperate. It feels really desperate to try to hold on to something that doesn't necessarily, no, that doesn't add, doesn't allow people to add their value to the world the way that they should be adding it. Maybe some people feel so connected to it that that's their purpose, that's their mission. And like, it's not just sort of this brainwashed mentality of this is what you do and this is how you do it. But Think about how many people are parts of these organizations who have something else inside of them that could be so amazing to contribute to the world that could bring something beautiful to other people. And instead, it's like you said, like, no, just fit in this box. This is where you belong. This is where you belong. And if you try to escape that box, you will be damned, right? And it's like even just seeing how you write about your practices and even on your website with like the photos that you have uh, like sort of just covered in splatters of paint. It's like the fact that that's the imagery that you chose, that th- those are the photos that you wanted to embody. I think it says a lot about the importance of opening up our worlds and allowing those creative parts out of us, allowing the messy parts to show, giving ourselves a chance to actually decide who we want to be not just who we were told we should be. Yeah. Yeah. So true. And like, it's, I feel like it's really important to note too, that like that within a Christian community, they would say you have the freedom of choice and they would say you can ask questions, but it's not consent if there's a gun to your head and like hell as a factor for you not believing is not a safe way of asking a question. Like it's, it's not safe to ask a question when if you think differently, you're going to be thrown out of the community that you find safety is. And when you when you said how desperate you do you have to be, I was just like, holy fuck. Like that's that is heartbreaking because so many of the populations of community that religion seeks to control and bring in 
are people who have been dismissed by society. Like think homeless shelters. And I have I have friends who deconstructed from Islam and have said very similar things. It's like religion is used to control populations mm-hmm. and is often used to control people of color. And like there is some deep rooted control shit in there, but they're preying on people like not preying on people, but like but both, both preying on people, <laughs> <laughs> praying mantising on people yeah. that are that are that don't have capacity because they they have the resources have been taken away from them to be able to think clearly. Like we create a f- ah, I'm gonna go off here. No, we go for it. No, this a- is what we're here for, Christina. <laughs> we created a fucked up system where we take away people's ability to make money. We take away people's ability to have health care and food. And we're like, you can work six jobs and have a child and pay for, you know, insurance and medical care for your family, which is a thousand dollars, right? On a fifteen dollar an hour salary, right? Why can't you do this? And then we're wondering why people are stressed out and desperate. We did that. And if you trace all of that back, 99.798 time, it's white supremacy. We do that because of racism. We have built our entire society on oppressing people's racism and religion, the patriarchy, to your point, you know, you had mentioned using sort of Zen Buddhist approach to some of what you do with coaching and I want to say it was maybe like three years ago I discovered Alan Watts for the first time. Are you a fan of his? Do you know him? I don't. Okay. I believe you. I feel like. So he's a British philosopher from like the 60s. And I'll find the clip and send it to you because I think it'll uh, it'll be interesting to get your feedback on it. But he says something along the lines of the way that a church is set up is that you have the priest or whomever at the head of the church um, standing on the altar, facing outward towards everybody else who is kneeling, submissive to them. And they also have people, you know, lined on either side, whatever. And that that is a direct reflection of the hierarchy of a royalty based system where the king is there looking down at the peasants. They're waiting for, you know, this person to dictate whatever it is they're going to do. And you certainly can't go after them because you've got these people lined up there to protect them. And so when you look at that through the lens of the church, standing right behind that guy is a massive fucking cross with Jesus crucified on it, which by the way, I thought about this recently. And when I would go to church when I was younger, I was so distracted all the time. First of all, I would count the shapes on the wall to to just not have to pay attention to what I was supposed to be ch- paying attention to. But the shapes on that wall were behind this massive crucifixion. And I'm thinking to myself, I would get this really sad, sick feeling looking at it because it's not lifelike gory, but you're looking at a man that is hanging from his hands and feet pinned to a cross and you are a child. Like that is not okay. Why are we refuting the ability for children to learn about so many things, but we're willing to accept just just thrust them into the trauma of witnessing somebody die so violently. Yeah, I watched The Passion of the Christ in theaters when I was 11, I think is when it came out. We, My parents brought me there. I threw up afterwards. I was very ill. I've never watched it. And there's a probably a good reason if that's yeah. the result, because I can't handle that don't, shit. <laughs> don't. But you're right. You're right. Patriarchy is is like, you know, hierarchical leadership, I guess, is probably a better way of putting it, is um, a huge pillar of propping up white supremacy is, is this like that um, hierarchical structure of like one person has to be more, other people have to be less, one person has to have more, get more to win, and the others have to lose. Yes. So this this speaks so perfectly to what you were describing about the attachments earlier too, right? We can't possibly have mutual success. And this is something that's always really blown my mind when it comes to working as well. Like having had so many corporate jobs 
where I watch people who are so ill qualified for the roles that they're in leadership positions. No, you're not a leader. You're pandering. And all you care about is getting to the next level. So you will step on whoever you need to step on to get yourself where you need to go, not thinking about the fact that you're probably throwing all those people under the bus right now who also now don't respect you at all. And the people who do respect you are hanging on your coattails to begin with. But what if we all shared the credit and the work and were able to contribute in equally meaningful ways, maybe some more meaningful than others, but to take away the sense that we can't all be successful. And I feel like that is what society has turned into when you speak about housing insecurity, food insecurity, um, just uh, gun violence, like all of these things that are happening. And it's like, we're not paying attention to the real issues. And instead of that, we're focusing on these manufactured culture wars that are so deeply rooted in white supremacy and in these really deeply religious philosophies, if you can even call them that. I don't even want to call them that. I feel like they're blatant disregard for humanity. It, it's that's <laughs> yeah. That's what it is. It's not... I don't feel like those are things to be debated. I feel like those are people's hate-fueled opinions that validate something that they need validated. It doesn't create community. It doesn't create cohesion. It creates distance and disconnection. And that's the goal though, right? As I'm saying it out loud, it's like, they don't want you to feel connected to yourself and they don't want you to feel connected to anybody else. No, I'm yes, I'm so glad you said that because I was like, why do you think that corporate guy is trying to climb the ladder? He was told he couldn't feel his emotions. He was taught that that was weakness. He was taught he had to get to the top to get respect and be worthy. He was taught that people were less than him. He was taught he was full of shit. So he had to make himself feel better by making other people feel like shit to prove that he's worthy. Like, all I want to say to all these people is like, can you just go to therapy and do the work already? Because I'm over it. Like I and don't you have... need it. Like you would be better off. You would be happier. Well, none that's of it, this right? serves anyone. <laughs> I think that's such a critical point. It's such a critical point, Christina. It's like at the end of the day, what we are here to do is hopefully live joyful lives and help impact people in a positive way. And we can't do that by being completely self-serving. We can have expectations and standards for ourselves and do our best to achieve things that we want to achieve. And those things don't all have to be the same, but that's the beauty in it too, is that you can have a combination of people with various, various different talents and capabilities, and you can do more for the world. But think about how much we've been limited by the fact that religion rules so much. I mean, I even listen, I listen to so much documentary shit and it's like thinking about how Galileo basically was like astronomy was set back like 200 years because people in religious facets didn't want to believe ast astronomy. And you're like, what the fuck? Like how much further along could we have been if you guys weren't like, no, but that's evil. <laughs> like it's bizarre. And I feel like the fact that we're still living in a world where this is happening and that you experienced this directly is a bit of an anomaly to me, honestly. Like I don't <laughs> understand how we've allowed it. Yeah, no, I think a lot of the world looks at that and is like, what? <laughs> I I want to talk about something really quick uh, that my brother told me last year, and I haven't stopped thinking about it. Um, he goes down rabbit holes where he studies something really amazing and profound and then shares it to me and then it blows my mind and I can't stop thinking about it. And he was studying the laws of the universe. Like there's this thing you can play with online where you set the rules and these little creatures just do the same thing over and over again. You change one thing, they do it elsewhere. It's like, there's actual laws that the universe functions by, like, right, gravity, you know, that kind of thing. Life actually functions by rules. Like, there, there's, like, they do these things, they do these things, right? And so that could be infinitely complicated. But, like, essentially, if you were, like, to know all the laws of the universe, you could technically predict what would happen next, right? But at the very beginning, the original law of the universe is B. Because the alternative would be to not be, and then we wouldn't exist at all. So be is the original law of the universe. Like what we are meant to do is to be. Mind blown. You're right. And I had had a conversation with somebody a couple of weeks ago who reflected that sentiment saying, 
we're often humans doing, not humans being. Mm. And it really stuck with me because we get so tied up in the money, the minutia, the things that don't really add value to our lives and just create more chaos. And I think about how much more harmonious things could be if we gave ourselves the freedom to just be. And part of that I feel is because in being, we are inherently going to be less judgmental because it's not about the projection of your feelings towards somebody rooted in what, you know, there's no substance to a lot of these moments of hate that people experience. And Nicole and I've done a bunch of TikTok lives and, and have had conversations around like so many people are like, Jesus will save you. And we're like, it probably won't happen. And that's okay. And we're like, you know, but people will ask, what do we do about these things? Right. How do we, how do we solve this problem? And I feel like part of what came to me last year, and I Googled this because I just needed to know, because that's how I operate is like, what's the foundation of hate? Like, how does hate start? What is that? And it's fear. And this gets back to what you were saying earlier, which is the less you know or understand something, the more you're going to fear it. And having that fear embodied within yourself as shame or self-hatred and not knowing enough about yourself to be able to dissect that and assess what is true, what is not true, means that you will blindly project that fear as hate onto other people and that you are going to feel validated in that somehow. And to me, that's the biggest difference between people who genuinely want to make a difference in the world is that you're open to change. You are open to reconsidering your system of beliefs. And I mean, you've done just that. I would love for you to maybe round out the episode, sharing a bit about where you are now and what your intention is to help people who have come out of similar situations such as yourself. Um, and also those who have not, because I know that that was sort of originally who you started with, but you've definitely expanded to a broader audience. So can you share a bit more about your coaching business and just really your philosophy and your mentality in doing that? Yeah, absolutely. I started out, um, you know, focusing on people who had deconstructed and that makes up about 50% of the people I work with. But what I started to uncover is that there was a lot of people resonating with my work who didn't have a Christian background. And um, the more I thought about it, the more that makes perfect sense. Like our our world was colonized by Christianity. And so those influences, patriarchy, capitalism, like the things that we're divesting from, attempting to divest from, have caused similar wounds to us. So like they, most people relate to an aspect of that because they've gone through a change or they've had to differentiate from their family or whatever. It's like those, those experiences at their root carry similar frequencies, I guess you could say. Um, so really, really my work is like my greatest, my greatest desire for people. I just want you to be able to be with yourself in peace. I want you to have space in your mind and to be able to like look at yourself and and find love there. I know that for me, like my journey was not from self-loathing to self-love. It was from self-loathing to acceptance and then a waver around the dance of romance for a very long time before I was like, I actually love myself. And I think that that's perfectly fine. But my desire and goal for all of my clients is that you begin to feel the depth of your mattering on the planet as a being being. Because like, oh, like makes me tear up. The weight of your existence is unfathomable. Every being's existence holds that much weight. And that's really what I try to invest in my clients through just seeing them and holding them in their sovereignty and their ability to make decisions for themselves and observing their process with grace and non-judgment. I'm not often at a loss for words, believe it or not. I want to sit with that for a second. I feel like 
what you just described is an opportunity for us as a society to ask ourselves the question, what the fuck am I, you know, but also who am I surrounding myself with that will make me feel safe in being all that I am? Because I had, I really like the way you described your journey to self-love because I feel similarly. Mm-hmm. I didn't realize until a couple of years ago where I was in therapy and I can't even remember the moment, but I just remember sort of acknowledging, I don't think I even like myself. And Mm -hmm. it wasn't this obvious self-loathing. It was this sort of just undercurrent, not Mm -hmm. feeling good enough, feeling rejected. When I was dating previously, I feel like I was very desperate. I, I wanted to be accepted. I wanted to feel connected to people. And if I had stronger feelings than they did, I would still try to like make that happen somehow because I needed that validation. Mm -hmm. And I went through this process of acknowledging that I first needed to be able to say I liked myself. Mm -hmm. And I almost feel like saying that you like yourself is a little bit harder than getting to the place where you say you love yourself because to realize that you don't like yourself, Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people don't love themselves but they might like themselves. And I think to it's a much bigger leap to go from loathing to even just liking. Mm-hmm. And when I was finally able to say I liked myself, I felt weird. I felt uncomfortable in my body. I thought this is stupid. Like, why do I need to say that? Mm-hmm. And then I realized I do like myself. I like who I've become because I'm no longer allowing myself to be beholden to other people's expectations of me in the mm-hmm. same way. I mean, I still care about the opinions of others when it comes to things that are important. Mm -hmm. Um, But not using that as a barometer by which to measure my likability or my lovability or any of the things that touch me at, at the core. It's just when you can tell within yourself that you don't accept something, it makes it really hard to project a sense of confidence to anybody else about who you are. And so once I was able to look at it it from the lens of, well, now I like myself. Doing this podcast has shown me how many different types of people there are, how many different journeys and different paths of just chaos and resilience and shared humanity and the power of the human spirit. It revived me in a lot of ways and led me to this place of being able to be self-accepting and self-liking and self-loving. But Mm -hmm. it, much like you said, was not a linear path and it was not by any means an expedited path. It was a conscious decision to acknowledge the parts of myself that I didn't like Mm -hmm. and make the choice to change those things, but in a way that felt right to me without looking to external sources for validation of that. And it changes everything when you prioritize that part of yourself. Mm. Yeah, that's powerful. Thank you. It was actually really quite powerful to say. (laughs) Yeah. It's like therapy, but free. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's really beautiful to hear you speak that out loud of yourself and your journey. I, I love that you're mentioning like, be acknowledging your feelings about um, where you're at in your work and with your podcast, because it's, I mean, like being able to see that is the same, it's the same thing you did with yourself. It's like, oh, I don't like myself right now. Like just being with that, it creates profound change. It creates a safety within yourself because you're not lying to yourself. So there's this coherence within you that's like, we feel it and now we actually said it. Otherwise, you've just got we feel it and we're denying it. Totally. But like when you put those two things together, it's like, yeah, and and literally nothing lasts forever. Like our culture tends to to think like a company is only great if it lasts forever. A relationship is only good if it lasts your whole life. Like that is not true. Everything ends in sadness. <laughs> well, that's that's really interesting. You're right. I mean, well, because when you lose something good or bad, there's grief. Uh I mean, I couldn't have gotten out of my last situation faster, but it ended really badly and that was hard. And 
losing my mom was a completely different type of grief that was earth shattering. Mm -hmm. And I will say that for me, I had started to transform for sure prior to all of that. But, you know, one of um, my friends said to me the other day, well, the you that you are now wouldn't be this if you hadn't gone through all of that. And nobody wants to be like, yeah, I'd love to relive all that trauma. It really got me to where I am. Like, you know, and that's not really what we're going for here. But but I, I do think that it's fair to say that I certainly put more energy into understanding myself because I didn't want to be unhappy anymore. And I didn't want to feel disconnected from myself. And I think that the scenarios that you've described, the things that I've felt in my own life, is when you feel disconnected from yourself, it is so much easier to let things slide and just sort of go about your day and let things be whatever they are and not hold yourself accountable to the things that you want. Yeah, because like you don't think you deserve them on some level. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Like, and the thing, the thing is like these things, these two things go hand in hand. Like um, the only like solution to fear a lot of the time is action. Like it, it's an antidote to fear, like actually doing something. So sometimes like, the, the process of self-care is like literally committing yourself to drinking a glass of water every morning. And like that action is your body showing you, oh, we care about you. We do this one thing. That repeated action, even when you don't feel it, is like this coherence of like, oh, there's a little bit of safety there. And then you can expand on that. But like there is this like there has to be both of those things happening. And like it depends on the person for where you need to start. But like it's really powerful to like, to see that in your own life. Yeah. And it's something that I definitely feel in my own experience. You can, you know, hindsight's always twenty twenty. It's easy to say it, but it's also really interesting to consider how profound of an impact it can have when you aren't just looking back, but you're looking back with more information and a better understanding of yourself and also a better understanding of people around you. Because I think part of what's challenging for us too is that we either are people pleasing and we're thinking about somebody else and not thinking about what we need or we're thinking about ourselves and maybe to the detriment of what other people might need from us. And so mm -hmm. I think it's really important to try to surround ourselves with people who are at the very least trying to understand and hopefully people who are open-minded and willing to have the hard conversations, whether it's about themselves or ourselves, or just in general, these things that have to change on a broader societal scale, because without these conversations, without a conversation like this, Christina, how do people learn? How do they understand? How do they get a sense of what reality is? And I feel like there's so many people out there with stories that have similar origins to yours coming out of an evangelical upbringing and the clarity that people achieve once they've, I don't know what the word is that I'm looking for. I kind of want to say um, extracted mm -hmm. themselves from that, yeah. that it's like your potential now has become limitless by comparison mm -hmm. to what you were told it could be your whole life. My hope is really that at least one person is going to listen to this and be able to have a moment of clarity about what they need for themselves in their own life, regardless of what it is that's stopping them from that right now. Because your intention and your thoughtfulness around your approach, as well as the way you described your coaching practice and why you do what you do, is so valuable and I would hate to think about what it would look like if you hadn't come to this place in your life, because I feel like you are such a valuable asset to this world and to helping people. Like I truly feel so connected to what you're doing and to you as a person that I, I feel like I can feel your potential through the conversations that we've had. And you had mentioned something, I think on your website, I had written it down as a note that, um, you found that you were incredibly good at holding space for the in-between, holding space for the undecided and the not knowing, and you became truly comfortable with uncertainty for yourself and for others, and that led you to coaching. Mm -hmm. I thought that was such a beautiful way of describing what you're capable of, what you've achieved for yourself, and what you can help other people achieve mm -hmm. while remaining incredibly humble because you you hold space tremendously well. 
Uh, I felt very seen in this conversation myself. I feel like this is the second time we've chatted and it's like talking to an old friend. And based on the conversations we've had, I'm certain our lives have not been super similar. But what I think is really amazing about that is how you can end up in the same place, so to speak, with people who have such different walks of life and be able to have such a shared gratitude and appreciation for that. Mm. I'm receiving that. Thank you so much. <laughs> of course. I also love that you said that. I feel like that's the best way to receive a compliment. Just acknowledge it. I feel very seen. I, uh, uh, one of the deepest stories in my life is that I, that people don't see me. And, um, that has really been debunked for me in many ways. And like you said, hindsight is twenty twenty. Um, and the beautiful thing about that is, is looking back, I can see the people and the ways that I was seen. And I've started to be able to appreciate it when it's actually happening now. <laughs> totally. I totally get that. The way that you described what I do, hold space for someone to be in the in-between and to be with someone is, it can be a really hard thing to like market. Like, and, and to, for other people to see the value and it's like, what you just are with people. And it's like, yeah, it's pretty awesome. <laughs> it's, well, it's incredible. Come sit with me. <laughs> yeah. But I think that's so cool. It's like, you raise a really interesting point about the fact that it can be hard to market because that's, I think what can be challenging as a coach. I have friends who are coaches. I've spoken to a lot of people on this podcast the variety of coaching modalities that there are, it's not one thing and it's mm -hmm. not one thing for everybody. And so I feel like I haven't personally worked with a coach, but based on the conversations that I've had, I imagine it's really similar to finding a therapist that you feel comfortable with. Mm. Don't just settle for the first one that you talk to. Like, no, that might be, you might know right away that this person could be a good fit for you, but Challenge yourself to ask if you're going to get the things that you need out of that relationship. And going into that conversation, be aware of what you're hoping to achieve. Mm -hmm. At least as much as you can, try to communicate that. I imagine some of it, um, correct me if I'm wrong here, is probably, I imagine some people have a bit of ambiguity and unknowns around what it is that they're trying to achieve, but they know that they need something. Whereas yeah. other people might have more definition around it. Yeah, I think my advice for this, if you're looking for a coach or a therapist or any kind of support in your life, you know, like, aside from logistics, because I'm not a logistics person, like, if you're you needing business support, go to a fucking business coach. But, like, otherwise, like, look for someone that you like. Totally. Like, look for someone that's easy for you to talk to, that, like, you enjoy, like, their presence doesn't feel intimidating, or, like, you want to be in a space with someone where you're just like, oh, I'm here. Yeah. Because the relationship is where the growth is going to happen. Like, you can't, it's really hard to have growth with someone who's just like, then tell me more, and, like, you're laying on a therapist's couch. Like, that doesn't feel emotionally safe for most people. Not, you know, some people might like it. It's a kink for others, but, yeah. like... <laughs> That's hilarious. Be yeah, safe. I, <laughs> yeah, I agree with you. That's a really good point. When I first met my therapist, we had a consult on the phone, and then I had my first session, and I remember coming back from it and being like, I don't know if that she's going to be able to provide what I need. And I'd been to a therapist before that I'd seen randomly sort of intermittently as I, as I felt I needed it, which it's like, if you're going as you think you need it, you're already late. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that timeline has been eclipsed at this point, but I remember her saying that if you're going to do this, you need to commit to weekly. And I was like, okay, fine. I guess I'll do it. And I remember going to the first session and feeling like, I don't know. I can't tell if like it makes sense for me if we feel like we'd be right for each other. But I recognized enough that I should and that I could communicate to her in the next session that I felt that way. Mm -hmm. Because my concern was that I just keep talking. And if you don't flag me down, this entire session will go by without you even saying anything to me while I've just talked the entire time. Which 
might be okay in some circumstances, but like I am going there to actually do the work and to try to help myself. And so I don't want to just be blabbering on and not sitting with things that I need to sit with. And you need someone who can interrupt you nicely. You're a hundred percent correct. This is also like, I have friends who are like, I've been told I'm terrible at interjecting. And I'm like, you got to get in there. It's like double Dutch. You just got to jump in when it feels right. You know? I love that reference. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but, but that's exactly it. You're so right. And I feel like, so I've been seeing this therapist now for, it'll be five years in the fall. So like, mm -hmm. The relationship that I built with her, I even said this uh, last night to my wife was, I appreciate the moments of levity. I appreciate the moments of feeling a closeness that isn't just that therapist client relationship. And it's not, and she's so ethically responsible and it doesn't cross boundaries. Like it's just, she's the perfect balance of mm -hmm. responsible and ethical and also warm and inviting and able to hold the space and appreciative and acknowledging of my moments of revelation or mm -hmm. making me circle back to the things that I tried to sidestep. And she's like, well, let's go back to that. And I'm like, I so hope you wouldn't catch that one. I thought we could just avoid it. And she's like, no, that's what you've been doing for years. Um, <laughs> so I'm like, oh, that's why I pay you. Um, but, you know, I, I think that that's just such an important thing to say. And I love how you phrased it so simply. You want to like them. You want to feel the sense of safety that you need. And it's hard because not everybody can be afforded the same opportunities to have the same providers. Obviously, healthcare in the States is its whole, whole own situation of complexities and disappointment there. But I feel like when it comes to coaching for you, this will be my last question. Um, what is it that gives you hope? What are the what are the moments that you appreciate the most when you're working with clients? Mm -hmm. Probably two things. I love getting like a text or a message from a client who's done something they were afraid of doing. Like I love that, like because that action in overcoming fear, like when they felt capable and they did the thing. Like yeah. hearing the excitement in their voice memo or video message or whatever it is, just like, just like, yeah, you did. <laughs> yeah, that's so gratifying. It is. And I also love when, when my ability to like, give a piece of wisdom hits at just the right time. So like my, one of my gifts is like, getting wisdom because I just like do a lot of shit that I just jump in and do. And I learn by experience and in conversations. And one of like, another reason I realized I was good at coaching is because I always tended to say the exact right thing at the exact right time. And people are just like, Oh, it was so helpful. And I'm like, I don't know what I said, but cool. And so now like in coaching, I've started to realize that just, just like, paying attention. It's like the right thing often just comes to me because it feels like it's coming from them. And it's like really, really beautiful to witness that. Like, it's almost like I am just like reflecting what uh, reflecting them and their, their wisdom, but like speaking it back to them and then it hits them. And it's just like, I just took everything you gave me, alchemized it and shared it with you. And that's why it hit you. But it's just so cool to be a part of that experience because it's their wisdom. Yeah, that's absolutely amazing. And I really appreciate the way that you described it too. It's such a brilliant moment for me when I share, whether it's wisdom or perspective with somebody who maybe just hadn't thought to look at something that way mm -hmm. and to feel like in some small way their life is better because of that. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's a big way. Um, and you have such a gift for that. I feel like there's no question in my mind that the fact that you facilitate these conversations and that type of growth, it just shows that you're on the right path whether this is where you stay 
or if something else, you know, sparks your, your passion. But I, I feel like right now where you are is exactly where you should be because the world needs more of it. Thank you. That of means course. a lot. Absolutely. Well, gang, that's all for this episode of Who the Fuck. If our conversation resonated with you and you want to learn more about Christina's story or services, you can visit her website, christinamcarlson.com. And Christina, do you want to tell people where they can follow you on social? Yeah, it's at Christina Carlson Life Coach on Instagram and at Christina C Coach on TikTok. That's where I'm sharing all those journal entries and random rants and shit that are fun. (laughs) <laughs> perfect. Perfect. I appreciate you so much. And I'm really glad to have had you here. And we will catch you next time, gang. Thanks for listening to Who the Fuck. And if you like what you hear, share the show with your friends, family, coworkers, or anyone else you think needs a healthy dose of introspection and raw authenticity. Feel free to rate and review wherever you get your podcasts. It's always appreciated. And you can also visit whothefck.com to check out more content. Plus, you can follow me on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube at who the FCK underscore pod to keep up to date with what's new in my world and for exclusive bonus content. Catch you on the flip side.